Member for Joondla. Uh, I just want to take this opportunity to share uh, my own thoughts and uh, make a contribution in relation to the 2015 and 16 budget. And uh, look, as tempting as it is to, I suppose, take the bait that has no doubt been put out there by members opposite over the last couple of days in relation to some of their ridiculous uh, claims and requests and accusations, uh, I will uh, abscond because there's a few other things I want to talk about. But I will say, and I think the member for Churchlands made an outstanding contribution to this House yesterday uh, in pointing out some of the hypocrisy uh, from those opposite and perhaps uh, the most telling of which was actually that the, uh, the policies that were costed by the WA Treasury, not by a political party, not by the Liberals, but by the under-treasurer in the lead-up to the 2013 election, Mr Acting Speaker, was that had the Labor Party won office in 2013, uh, and assuming even quite generously so that we wouldn't have had the double impact of uh, falling GST or iron ore prices, that state debt under a Labor government right now would have been significantly higher. Yet they have the gall to uh, claim that not only would they have done a better job, but in the same sentence reckon that we, don't, that we haven't done enough for this state. I'll leave it at that. Like I said, if anyone's interested for a more concise review of that, I would invite them to have a look at the contribution that the member for Churchlands has made, which I thought was spot on. Now, the Treasurer, in handing down this budget, the Treasurer in handing down this budget framed it as occurring in the most challenging economic and fiscal environment the state has faced in at least three decades. Now, that's not a small claim to make. Member for Girouin. And we know it's been discussed fairly broadly. There are two key reasons for this. One is the GST, and one is a falling iron ore prices and the impact that that's having on our royalty income. Now, I don't intend to get bogged down on the GST, although it is a subject I'm fairly passionate about, but suffice to say that it would seem, thankfully, that across the nation, perhaps not with some of the other state governments, but certainly within the media, the national media seems to have finally cottoned on that it's very difficult to take an argument that getting 30 cents in the dollar uh, of GST for WA is easily justifiable. That in its own right is, I believe, already a major victory, that the national media is coming around to that logic. And I will say that our own media, be it our television and our print media, uh, did a sterling effort, I believe, in continuing to keep the injustice around the GST redistribution at the forefront. Again, it's, it's very interesting to note that uh, we hear from members opposite, uh, as soon as we mention the GST debate, they almost uh, wear it as a badge of honour that, uh, well, we, we didn't sign up to the GST. The Liberal and uh, National Party signed up to the, the GST and uh, therefore it's all your problem. <laughs> the interesting thing about that is the GST as a tax is actually not the issue. Uh, a broad-based consumption tax, as we know, is used broadly around the world. Most of the European countries and uh, all over the place, uh, we've got consumption taxes, and they've got great merit. So the tax itself is not the issue. What is at issue, really, is the Commonwealth Grants Commission that goes about in uh, deciding how it gets redistributed. So it's a little bit rich for those opposite saying, oh, well, we had nothing to do with bringing in the GST. The GST is not the issue. It's a Commonwealth Grants Commission methodology which dates back to the 1930s, which is actually broken. Now, recently we uh, saw in an opinion piece uh, from Gareth Parker from the West Australian, uh, basically reminding all West Australians not to grow tired of fighting for a better GST deal. And he raised an interesting point. He said, you know, it's one of those things that if you talk about it often enough, maybe sometimes people eventually become a little bit... Uh, immune to it and you know they roll their eyes and move on but uh, he reminded us and I believe very rightly so that we cannot grow tired of fighting for a better distribution deal for Western Australia and I'm glad to say that members uh, on this side of the house uh, have not grown tired and will not grow tired of fighting for a better GST deal for WA. And I think we've shown quite succinctly, actually, that even when there is a federal government of the same political persuasion as us, that that does not hold us back. We have not in any way held back of challenging our federal government in relation to getting a better deal um, for uh, WA. And I will say, actually, uh, that uh, the members opposite also haven't stopped fighting 
for the GST. But the only reason they haven't stopped fighting is because they never started fighting in the first place. The biggest party that was absent from the debate about trying to get a better deal for WA was WA Labor. I say WA Labor because, ironically enough, federal Labor even got the notion that something had to be done. I remember reading an opinion piece by the Honourable Alana McTiernan where she herself was admonishing the fact that now Hobart was uh, no longer a capital city and under the rationale was, you know, Melbourne was now the capital city for Tasmania and therefore they were getting, uh, Tasmania was getting a greater deal of uh, GST income. And so you even had the Honourable Alana McTiernan backing WA in its fight for GST. At the 11th hour, which is typical of Bill Shorten, but even at the 11th hour, even Bill Shorten, I think, saw the writing on the wall and started to indicate that he thought WA was getting a raw deal. In amongst all of this discussion, WA Labor was notably absent. WA Labor was, has been, and I believe will continue to be, missing in action when it comes to fighting for a better deal. And why is that? Because they've made the quite conscious choice to uh, seize what they believe as an opportunity to score some political points at the pain that we as a state uh, are experiencing because of this, this injustice. So rather than acting in the best interests of West Australians, rather than realising that uh, this is an opportunity to put politics aside, they've chosen, no, 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 no. In fact, the more pain that West Australians will feel, uh, potentially, they believe, might give them some kind of a, a political advantage. And it's interesting to note that we have heard from our Treasurer previously that when the Honourable Eric Ripper was in uh, Parliament, uh, he was more than capable of putting politics aside uh, and standing shoulder to shoulder uh, on this issue. But under the current WA Labor uh, leader, that is not the case. Now, in relation to iron ore, I will concede the notion that has been bandied around the place that it was always going to be unlikely that iron ore prices would remain at record highs. And they had been at some very record highs. But conversely, I also want to right from the outset reject outright the notion that somehow industry and government alike should have foreseen iron ore prices plunging to the recent lows that we've seen of $47.50. And then now they're hover hovering around the $60 mark. I think they're just below $60 today. Somehow, Labor will have us believe that everyone foresaw that. The banks, the forecasters, the iron ore companies themselves, everyone apparently should have seen that coming. It is an absolutely ridiculous proposition. Uh, it is, no one would have seen it going from what was believed to be $122 a tonne down to the lows that we have seen now. In fact, it's so ridiculous it's not even worth spending too much time debating I do want to talk a little bit about iron ore prices because I want to explain a little bit in relation to where the uh, price plunge has come from. And you see what's happening at the moment, I know there's some talk going on federally and uh, you know, people are saying we should be limiting exports or that there could be some kind of collusion. Uh, I don't necessarily believe there's collusion. I think the, the, the players in the iron ore market probably hate each other far too much for that. Um, and I'm not an advocate for restricting exports. But I believe what we have going on right now, federally, it's not federally, sorry, within the iron ore industry, is nothing but a good old-fashioned price war. And it's not uncommon. We've seen price wars before. We've seen price wars uh, actually fairly recently between Qantas and Virgin. Admittedly, the consumer probably benefited a fair bit from that. Um, members might be interested to know that uh, that price war between Qantas and Virgin, where they basically flooded the market with supply in the, in the uh, form of extra flights and uh, more regular flights and, and heavy discounting, was costing the two companies $8.75 million of profit a day. We know that there's a price war going on between some of the uh, grocery companies, Coles and Woolworths, and their uh, struggle for market share. Now, without resulting to the most basics of an economics lessons, I think it is worth saying that the aim of a price war is actually fairly simple. The tactic behind it is to promote competitor attrition. You oversupply a market, uh, the market responds by, it'll absorb that extra supply, but uh, the normal result is that prices drop. And uh, those in the market that are higher cost producers tend to shut down or exit the market. And those that are left are then able to raise prices again and uh, 
generally the, the concept is that they will recoup whatever losses or lower profits they might have made uh, during the price war itself. However, the current experience that we're seeing with iron ore pricing is a little bit more complex than that. There's actually impacts both from a demand and a supply side happening in the economic model, including both real and speculative influences. I think that's important to note because in iron ore, they, we do have a futures market for iron ore, and we've seen that in any kind of market where you've got future trading, uh, you don't always need to have the, re, uh, the reality happen for prices to be impacted. Markets can get jittery just by announcements. So when you've got uh, market players making announcements about uh, expansion projects and ramping up output, that in its own right, even though that the, the reality of that might be years away, could be enough to impact uh, iron ore pricing. Now we know that uh, the price for iron ore is very, very closely linked to what's happening in China. China has, up until recently, been experiencing phenomenal growth in, in excess of 10% GDP growth per year. And that's slowed down now to still a very solid 7%. But nonetheless, some of the demand in China has come off. And in fact, the biggest consumer of steel production in China is the, uh, uh, the, the development section, the retail, real, real estate section. Building buildings is one of the key uh, consumption sectors for steel, and we've seen a, uh, certainly a strong decline in that section. So what's happened? Uh, we've heard of BHP and Rio and uh, even Vale today in the media uh, announcing that despite the drop in demand, they are going to go ahead with expansion projects. They are going to continue to bring online uh, more iron ore, which is not what you would expect to be a normal response in a, in a market. Generally, when there's a drop in demand, the general response you normally look for is a reduction in supply, and then you get a new equilibrium. Um, but because we've increased supply at the same time that demand has dropped, you have a fairly precipitous impact. And in fact, former BHP chief Brian Gilbertson stated the following, when you see a price collapse of this magnitude, it's clear there is a major imbalance between supply and demand in the immediate future. The majors can't do much about demand, so the proper response should be to consider cutting back on supply. Instead, they seem to have a last man standing approach where they remain committed to expanding and driving others out of the market. This is former BHP chief Brian Gilbertson making that statement. So we've got a price war underway. As a result of that, you've got some uh, commentators or observers, including Citigroup, which is you know, a major uh, uh, bank that has a great interest in uh, understanding where some of these prices are going to go, Citigroup was recently quoted as saying that it's possible that iron ore could fall to as low as $36 a tonne in the third quarter of this year, and they're saying it's even possible that it'll stay below $40 for the rest of the year. Uh, further analysis actually showed that in, in order for us to get the iron ore price back to around $90 a tonne, you would need to take approximately 200 million tonnes of production out of the current supply of about 1.5 billion tonnes. So actually, the supply would need to contract about 200 million tonnes for us to have the opportunity to see prices perhaps return to $90 a tonne. However, instead, what we're seeing is uh, actually production is increasing. And in fact, it's uh, expected that we're going to have an incremental increase in export growth of over 110 million tonnes in 2015 alone, 68 million tonnes of which should come from Rio Tinto. And even new Chinese mines, even though they are at the uh, higher end of the cost curve, are bringing on more production. And the Chinese mines, actually, the interesting point in all of this, because the assumption always had been that uh, once prices dropped, it would be the Chinese mines that would be the first to close. And in the past, that's exactly what had happened. In the past, prices would drop, and the high-cost Chinese mines would uh, close fairly quickly. But this time round, that has not happened. And I would suggest China's cottoned onto the tactics of some of the major iron ore players and have decided, no, we're not going to play ball. We quite like iron ore prices being low. Let's not forget they are one of the largest consumers of iron ore. And in fact, they've introduced generous subsidies to keep their high-cost mines running. And so now we have this game of uh, who's going to be the first person to flinch. And I've got to say, as a local member, it's very upsetting when we see uh, great companies like Atlas Iron struggling. A lot of people in the Joondalup electorate uh, work in uh, fly-in, fly-out work. I think having a competition in our own marketplace is good. 
having additional mines and, and miners in the marketplace uh, provides uh, a lot of opportunities for the services sector and the support sector. So it's very uh, sad to see that kind of a corporate game being played. Now we know that actually in the forward budget, uh, in the budget forward estimates that were handed down at the mid-year review level, we had already adjusted our uh, expectation of iron ore prices. So this is November, December last year, and even at that level, uh, our forward estimates were based on 77, 78, 79 dollars a tonne. By the time the actual state budget came around, which we're now debating, uh, we've had to readjust that now down to $47.50 per tonne, uh, rising to just over $60 a tonne by 2018-2019. Every dollar variance, plus or minus on that figure, equals $70 million annualised for our budget. So in fact, if it goes below $47.50, uh, every dollar below, it would cost us $70 million a tonne. Now, like I said, price wars in and of themselves are not illegal. Companies undertake them. The big difference, I believe, in this instance, however, is that in this instance, the WA public, as the rightful owner of the iron ore, is an unwilling participant, seeing their return for non-renewable resource, you can only ever sell it once, dwindle away in order to facilitate the power plays of corporates in the industry. And so I actually think we need to have a discussion about that. I think it's right that members in this place and as a government and as a parliament, we need to have a look at uh, are we happy with that outcome? At what point do we say that uh, no, we are no longer happy to sell our iron ore at a price that's too low? You can only ever sell it once. The iron ore belongs to the, the people of Western Australia. Now, our royalty rate at the moment is, uh, is based uh, on an ad valorem value of the uh, value of the ore at the mine head. And this generally translates into a rate of 7.5% for non-beneficiated ore. Now recently we had iron ore prices at $48 a tonne. At $48 a tonne, the Western Australian public was just re receiving just $3.60 per tonne for the sale of its non-renewable resource. Can I just seek an extension please, Mr Speaker? If the price were to drop, as predicted, to $35 a tonne, the WA public would receive only $2.63 per tonne in royalties. So I actually think that uh, we need to have a look at that and go, at what point? How low would iron ore prices have to go before we would need to say, as the custodians of that iron ore, as the representatives of the people, where we would actually say, no, you know what, enough's enough, we don't really want to sell iron ore at a price below that. Now, I've already said earlier, I don't believe in uh, restricting export volumes and uh, uh, stopping the mining companies from doing what they want to do, but I do believe that we may need to look at uh, cushioning the WA public from the impact of this price war. And I think it is a worthy discussion to have <coughs> that should we perhaps introduce a floor on royalties paid? Should we introduce a minimum floor where we say, look, irrespective of the price of iron ore, if it dips below that, you'll still pay a minimum price on that iron ore. Now, actually, the interesting thing is there's actually precedence for that. And one of the earliest state agreements that BHP entered into with the government, and that's back in 1964, that state agreement, it's actually the Iron Ore Mount Goldsworthy Agreement Act of 1964, included a minimum royalty rate or floor price of six shillings per tonne. It says here in the Act, nevertheless, in regard to talking about royalties, nevertheless, such royalty shall not be less than six shillings per tonne in respect of ore of the subject of any shipment or sale. So back in 1964, we already had a floor price where we said we will charge you a percentage, but not less than six shillings per tonne. Now, it's certainly uh, not up to me to determine where potentially any floor may go in, but I believe it's something that we should discuss. It's something we should look at. Now, I do believe that if we were to look at that, we may also want to include what I've referred to as an export volume threshold, below which the floor pricing policy would not apply. My rationale for that is that some of these junior miners, they're already hurting under this price war, which was not of their doing. And also, if you're a miner that's starting out, if you're an Atlas Iron or BC Iron, by the very nature of starting a, a new mine up, you don't have the same uh, efficiencies and benefit of higher production rates to bring your costs down. And so I believe you'd need to set a, a figure 
could be 75 million tonnes, could be 100 million tonnes per annum, something along that line, where you say if you're producing less than that, you won't be uh, subject to the floor. Once you export more than that, then you would be subject to the floor. Now remember, irrespective of the floor price, beyond that, the uh, royalty rate doesn't actually change. It's still 7.5%. If iron ore rebounds to $80 and $70 or whatever it might be, and depending on where you put the floor, they're not actually paying any more royalties than they are now. But what we're saying is that if you want to go and enter a price war, if you want to enter a game of last man standing with a resource that belongs to the WA public, which we can only ever sell once, that we're not willing to follow you down all the way down to the bottom. You can export as much as you want. I'm not suggesting we stop people from exporting. But what I'm interested in is a discussion to make sure that the people of Western Australia are getting a fair price, a fair return <coughs> for their iron ore. And I think that it's very important to make that discussion. <coughs> this is not about tinkering around with taxes. A royalty is not a tax. Far from it. A royalty is a very, very important mechanism to compensate the public, the state, for the sale of their commodity. It's no different for the miners. The royalty is the cost of their raw material input. If you're a car manufacturer, you go and buy steel as your key input. If you're an iron ore miner, you're buying that iron ore off the state, the people of Western Australia. And at the moment, we don't have a say in relation to what our return is because if the price plunges, we just have to take that price. I think it's very worthwhile to explore, maybe looking at uh, putting a flaw in to make sure that at least as a, as a government we're saying to our public, no, we will look after you. If the price goes too low, we will still demand that we get a minimum amount. Now, it's interesting, there's, there'd be no doubt there'd be some arguments against this, <coughs> and I can already preempt some of them now. The Chamber of Minerals and Energy, uh, in their pre-budget submission, almost preemptively defended the industry in relation to their current activity by claiming that WA producers are price takers and not price makers, and that if WA producers don't meet demand, others in the world market will. I don't believe that mar argument makes a lot of economic sense as most of the other producers around the world at the moment are running at a loss. Really only BHP and Rio at the moment are the only ones that are making any profit. And if you're making a loss, I can't imagine you would increase your loss-making production to maintain a state of oversupply. And again, former BHP Billiton CEO Brian Gilbertson also rejects the same notion, saying there would be no new investment in iron ore given the glut of supply and over-demand. The other argument that the Chamber of Minerals and Energy put forward in the pre-budget submission, which was around uh, warning not to make any changes to royalties, was that uh, doing so would discourage future investment in WA resources. Again, I don't think that argument holds up. Arguably, the reason we had the high level of investment in our resource sector recently was because we had a high iron ore price. You could probably argue that it was because the iron ore price was well north of $80 a tonne that we had companies like BC Iron and Atlas Iron and Mount Gibson and the like actually entering the market. If the price is suppressed to a level of $50 or $47, $50 or even $60 where it is now, uh, I don't believe uh, you're going to see too much new investment in our resource sector. Another um, argument might be that uh, introducing a policy like a floor model would make WI and all producers uncompetitive. Well, you need to look at all of the uh, taxation regime, not just royalties, uh, when you're comparing us with... Uh, other competitors. Our nearest competitor outside of China is actually Brazil. Now they do indeed have a low royalty rate. In fact, their current royalty, royalty rate is only 2%. So even under the current model, they're significantly lower than uh, uh, where we are at now. But Brazil also has a much higher company tax rate, 34% their company tax rate is. And their GST equivalent consumption tax has a rate of 25%. So you need to look at uh, all of the various taxes and royalties and transport costs uh, if you, before you make the argument that uh, one particular change is going to make us uncompetitive. People will throw up the argument, sovereign risk, sovereign risk. Well, can I tell you that both Indonesia and China have recently increased their iron ore royalty rates, so WA would certainly not be alone in looking at changing a policy, and respected risk assessment agency COFACE Still, risk, uh, still rates Australia both on country risk and business climate risk as A2 and A1. Pretty much the two best ratings you can get in relation 
to sovereign risk. The other argument that might come forward is that this policy would result in job losses amongst the affected miners. And perhaps that's maybe the most ludicrous argument that could possibly come up, because the reality is the current price war is already costing jobs, not only amongst the likes of Atlas Iron or BC Iron, but even amongst the very main players in the game. BHP and Rio have laid people off, and certainly they're putting an enormous amount of pressure on the suppliers that work with them, and we've seen job losses there as well. So the reality is we've already got job losses under the current regime. And one would imagine that any further job losses amongst affected miners would likely be as a result of scaling back current production or shelving intended future expansion projects, which in essence is exactly what should be occurring to restore the price of iron ore to a more realistic <coughs> setting, which in turn would lead to more viable miners and more jobs. Like I said, as a humble backbencher from Joondalup, it's just my opinion. I have worked in the mining industry previously. I'm passionate to see it do well and be vibrant. I don't like seeing uh, people in my electorate lose jobs state because state. of the, uh, the uh, price wars being undertaken. Whilst I'm not advocating, like I said, any restriction on exports, and I'm not suggesting that uh, there's collusion happening, which I know federally they were looking at that. I don't believe any of that's happening. I think this is typical behaviour by companies that are trying to get an upper hand. What I don't want to see is the WA public be an unwitting participant in that. Uh, and I believe there needs to be a point where we say, look, if you guys want to do what you're doing and you want to export that many tonnes and the result of that is flooding the market and uh, the price is going to tank, so be it. But there comes a point where we will say we don't want to accept selling our iron ore to you at a price below a particular level. What that level may or may not be uh, is beyond me. But like I said, I would couple that with an export threshold uh, so to protect some of the junior miners who haven't had the benefit of uh, efficiencies of scale yet. That might be at 75 or 100 million tonnes. So if you're exporting below that, if you're an Atlas or BC Iron, you know, if the price does go down, you're not going to be subjected to the right. floor. Thank you, Member.